Hello, this is Chef John from FoodWishes.com with Classic Pumpkin Pie. That's right, I'm finally making public the secret Food Wishes version for this iconic Thanksgiving dessert. And no matter how dry your turkey is or how lumpy your gravy, if you put this out for dessert, all will be forgiven. Not forgotten. All right, we are talking about family, but it will be forgiven. So let me show you how to do this. The good news, easiest pie filling ever. So check it out. So we're going to start with one can of pumpkin puree in a mixing bowl. Do not use pumpkin pie filling. That's got a bunch of stuff in it. We're going to put our own stuff in. So one can of pumpkin puree, to which we're going to add one whole egg plus three egg yolks. And if you're one of these people that always gets that giant crevice, that big gaping crack down the middle of your pie after it's cooled, you're going to love this recipe. This has been adapted to avoid that. The main reason for that problem is overcooked egg white. When that cools, that causes that big crack, that separation. We're not going to have that here. So good news there. Plus, it's also going to be a little richer, a little more custardy because of the extra egg yolk. All right, so everybody wins. Okay, next up, we need our dairy and our sugar, which we're going to get in the same ingredient by adding one can of sweetened condensed milk. I really like this better than the recipes that call for evaporated milk and sugar. And believe it or not, that's pretty much our pumpkin pie filling, except, of course, for the spices. And here's what I put in. This has always been a closely guarded secret that was only recently declassified. We're going to go with some freshly grated nutmeg. You know we always grate our nutmeg fresh here at Food Wishes. If you're using pre-ground nutmeg out of a can that you bought before there was an internet, maybe time to get some fresh stuff. We're also going to add some cinnamon, a pinch of Chinese five spice, you know, to be mysterious, and some ground ginger. All right, so we're going to take a whisk and we're going to mix that very, very thoroughly. And as I was mixing this, I realized I'd forgotten one of the most important ingredients, the salt, which sounds kind of weird for a dessert. But without that salt, you're going to get a very flat taste. You just really need that to bring out the sweetness and the flavors in the other ingredients. So don't forget the salt. So I tossed that in. And once that was mixed very, very, very thoroughly, it's time to pour it into a prepared pie shell. Now, of course, I'm assuming you're going to go to Food Wishes and watch our video on how to make pie dough. But if you don't, that's fine. You could use pre-made, pre-rolled pie dough like I did. It's fine. It's Thanksgiving. There's a lot going on. Don't judge me. But of course, if you do use pre-made pie dough, at least go around with your finger and make some imperfections so it looks like you did it yourself. It will give the impression that you care. All right. So regardless whether it's homemade or store-bought, we're going to pour in our filling. We're going to give it a little shake a shake -a, and then, of course, the old tapa tapa. And why we're doing that? Because there might be air bubbles in the filling, which, of course, would cause, well, they wouldn't cause anything. Absolutely no problem at all. But it's traditional. We give it the old tapa tapa, so do it. And once you tap that, we're going to place that in the center of a preheated 425 degree oven for just 15 minutes. Then turn it down to 350 for another 30 to 35 minutes or until it's just barely set. And here's how you're going to be able to tell. We're going to test it with the tip of a knife. They generally say to go in about an inch and a half from the edge to test, which I did. And you see that perfectly clean. So that means the pie is done. Even if the center is slightly undercooked, it will continue to cook as it cools. But you'll see here, I tested all the way to the center and it came out clean. And that was just after 30 minutes at 350. So don't go any farther than that. Do not overcook this. That will cause it to crack when it cools. Okay. And by the way, see that mark there? I made that with the edge of the towel. It was very unfortunate. So I'm just going to put that on a rack. We're going to cool that completely before we try to cut it. I actually prefer it chilled, but that's just me. But at least let it cool all the way down to room temperature. And was I upset that I marred the surface of my beautiful pumpkin pie just to demonstrate that doneness stuff with the knife? Yeah, a little bit. But that's okay. My Photoshop skills are legendary. And we have whipped cream, which of course is going to let us cover any flaws. So I'm going to put a very, very sexy dollop of whipped cream on there. And just in case you're not sure how to do a very sexy dollop of whipped cream, check out this slow motion footage. It's all about that half turn at the end. So you're going to give it a twist, three thrusts, and the pull. And there you go. And then to finish, a little light dusting of cinnamon just to give it that final magazine cover quality look. And not to be immodest, because you know I am very, very extremely humble, but that really does look awesome. And that is done. The official Food Wishes version for classic pumpkin pie. And like I said earlier, by tweaking that recipe with the eggs, not only do we have a virtually crack-proof pie, but it's also going to be a little richer, a little creamier, a little more custardy, which is what I think makes this so special. Okay? So I really hope you give that a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual.
And as always, enjoy. Classic pecan pie. That's right. Yes, pecan. You know what? On second thought, I should have went with pecan and we will. Actually, that's not much better. But anyway, April is National Pecan Month, or if you prefer, Pecan Month. I'm really not sure which pronunciation is correct. Probably neither. But anyway, I've never posted a classic version of this pie until now. And of course, the first thing we're going to need is a ready-to-bake pie shell. And you can use one of our fabulous recipes to make this, or you can buy it pre-made. It really doesn't matter to me. I don't judge you. And I'll give links and more info about that on the blog, but basically we need one 9.5 inch pie shell ready to bake. And what we're going to need to do before we fill this is something called blind baking. And to do that, we're going to use these. Those are pie weights and some of this parchment paper. So we're going to go ahead and take a round piece of parchment paper, bigger than the pie, of course, and center that over the top, kind of push it down a little bit. And then we'll go ahead and pour in our pie weights. And we'll go ahead and we'll try to distribute those as evenly as possible. You really want to try to get them up against the edge. And of course, I realize a lot of you don't have pie weights to use. In that case, just go ahead and use your tart weights. By the way, dry beans also work perfectly. So go ahead and spread those out all the way to the edge, best you can. Kind of even them out. Possibly give them an old shake a shake And what this is going to allow us to do is pre-bake this pie crust a little bit without it losing its shape. So once we have that set, we'll pop that in the middle of a 350 degree oven for 20 minutes. And after 20 minutes, we'll go ahead and pull it out and transfer those pie weights into a bowl and be very careful. There's nothing worse than a whole bunch of small hot balls rolling all over your kitchen floor. So watch what you're doing. And once we've carefully and successfully removed our parchment and pie weights, we're actually gonna go ahead and pop that back in for another 10 minutes. And that will finish the pre-baking phase. And by the way, one optional step since the oven's already hot, I like to give my pecans about a seven or eight minute toasting beforehand. So when I see there's about seven or eight minutes left in the timer, I'll go ahead and pop the nuts in. And then when the timer rings, we'll go ahead and remove our pie shell, which at this point should be a very, very light golden color. So our crust is ready. Our pecans have been lightly toasted, and it's on to the rest of the filling, which could not be simpler. So into a saucepan, we're going to toss a whole stick of butter, and then three kinds of sugars. Some white sugar, some light brown sugar, and some corn syrup. Ooh, scary. But relax, it's not scary. This is just good old-fashioned light corn syrup. This is not the same stuff as the evil high fructose corn syrup. I consider high fructose corn syrup the margarine of sweeteners, so do not eat or drink things with that in it. Next up, we're going to toss in a little bit of flour, a little bit of milk. Actually, I was out of regular milk, so I used almond milk. So basically, that makes me a hipster. That's fine. I was going to grow a soul patch anyway. We're also going to need some salt, a little bit of vanilla extract. And yes, that bottle right there is bourbon. So I'm going to add a tablespoon of whiskey. And you might be thinking, why are you using your good stuff? Uh, that's not my good stuff. But anyway, at that point, we're going to go over to the stove. And we're going to put that on medium heat. And basically, we want to bring this to a boil. So I'm going to give it a stir. And I have absolutely no idea why I'm trying to do this with a spatula. So I'm going to go ahead and switch to a whisk here. When it comes to whisking, whisks are so much better. So we're going to give that a stir as it comes up to temperature. And eventually you'll see it bubbling around the outside, around the outside, around the outside. And at that point, I like to give it another stir. And then in just about a minute or two, you should see it come to pretty much a full boil. And as soon as we see that, turn off the heat immediately. All right, so the heat's off. We'll give it a stir. And we're just going to let that sit there, cooling on the stove a little bit for about five or ten minutes. And why we want to let that cool down just a little bit is because the next step is going to be to introduce this to some eggs. And there they are. I got three large eggs. So we'll go ahead and we'll bust those three eggs in the yolks and we'll go ahead and give them a fairly thorough whisking. And then once we've done that and our sugar mixture has sat for a few minutes, we'll slowly drizzle it into the egg mixture. Start slow, of course, because you don't want to scramble these. So I'm going to splash a little in, stir it up, splash a little more in, stir it up. And once the first half of that's been kind of stirred in semi-gradually, you can go ahead and add the rest quicker. And as soon as that's all mixed in, we are ready for final assembly. By the way, make sure your oven is still on 350. So to get this ready for the oven, let's go ahead and add our pecans to our pre-baked pie shell. And by the way, please use pecan halves, not chopped pecans. I'm sorry, but I consider chopped pecans for this pie borderline unholy. And then once the pecans are in there, let's go ahead and pour in our filling. And that should just about come up to the edge of the crust. And by the way, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that every nut has been coated with that mixture. So I do like to spatulate that a little bit, make sure there's no dry ones on top. And by the way, if you can sneak a few more pecans in, go ahead. Mine looked like it was just a hair underfilled, so I put in a few more nuts. 
So that's me and you adjusting. But bottom line, you want to fill that just below the top of the crust. And at that point, we're pretty much ready for the oven. Of course, just to be safe, we'll give it a couple old shake shakas and a few old tapa tapas And then we'll go ahead and we'll place that back in the center of our 350 degree oven. And we'll bake it for about 40 to 45 minutes until it looks like this. It should totally look amazing. The crust should be a beautiful golden brown. And if you do happen to give it a little jiggle like this, you shouldn't see any wiggle in the center. All right, if your center seems a little soupy, put it back in for a few minutes. But once it is done, I want you to make sure you let this cool completely before you try to slice it. I like to go traditional and let mine cool in front of an open window. And of course, if you do that also, I will give you the standard disclaimer, watch out for bears. And then of course, once it's cooled, your patience will be rewarded with a gorgeous slice of pecan pie, which you could eat as is, or a la mode, which is of course French for with ice cream. Not really, but in America, that's what it's French for. So I top mine with a little vanilla ice cream, and that is almost too gorgeous to eat. Almost. So let me take a bite here, and there's just no words. There's a reason this is such an iconic American pie, and as you know, I'm not a big dessert person, but this really is a spectacular treat. So anyway, there you go, classic pecan pie. If Chef John can pecan pie, so pecan you. So I really do hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Buttermilk pie. That's right, unless you're from certain areas of the South, you may have never had this before or even heard of it, which really is a shame. Imagine if only people in the Southwest knew about tacos or only people around New York knew about pizza or only people in Pennsylvania enjoyed Scrapple. Okay, that last one might not have been a great example. But what I'm trying to say is this pie should be way more popular than it is. And that's because not only is it easy to make, it is incredibly delicious. So with that, let's go ahead and get started by prepping our crust. And for that, you're gonna need some prepared pie dough. I'm using my butter crust recipe, exactly one half of that. And of course, I'll provide links in the blog post. And what we'll do is go ahead and roll that out and then we'll transfer that into our pie dish by rolling it up on our rolling pin, which allows us, as you'll see, to place it in perfectly centered. Or not. So I kind of missed. But that's okay, we'll just reposition and make sure that's nicely tucked into our pan or dish. And then once that's set, we'll take a knife and trim off any excess dough all the way around at the outside edge of the dish. And by the way, I enjoy using these sort of deep ceramic pie dishes, but I'm pretty sure you could adapt this to any pie pan you like to use. So we'll go ahead and trim off that extra dough around the outside. And then we're gonna go around folding in about a half inch of the dough to the inside edge, which should, if everything goes according to plan, give us a double thickness of dough all the way around the outside. Around the outside, around the outside. And the whole reason we wanna double up that dough around the outside edge is because the next thing we're gonna do is do a decorative crimp. And contrary to that popular expression that crimping ain't easy, I'm gonna show you just how simple this is. Okay, to crimp the dough, we just take two fingers on the inside and then press in between them with one finger from the outside. And by doing that all around the edge every inch or so, you're gonna have a pretty fairly professional looking design. And one thing to keep in mind, once these pies are filled and baked, they always look really good. So please crimp with confidence. And then even though the traditional buttermilk pie is usually cooked using a raw crust, I'm gonna go ahead and do what's called a blind bake. And the first step of that would be to dock this with a fork which simply means prick the dough here and there, maybe 10 or 12 times in the bottom, and then a few times around the sides, at which point I'm gonna place in a piece of parchment paper and then pour in my baking weights, which are nothing more than ceramic balls. And what these do is sort of weight down the crust so it doesn't bubble up while we do this little pre-bake. So we will dump those in and even them out, and then sort of push those up the sides as well as we can. We really only need a single layer on the bottom, Oh, by the way, you can do this exact same step using dried beans, or you can actually just skip it all together. And if your crust bubbles up a little bit, you can push it down as it cools. And then what we're gonna do once that's set is go ahead and pop that into the center of a 350 degree oven for 15 minutes. And basically that's gonna give this crust a little bit of a head start so that when our final pie is cooked, we don't have an undercooked, gummy, raw, starchy tasting crust at the bottom. And then what we need to do as soon as that comes out is very carefully, using the parchment paper, lift out those baking weights and transfer them into a bowl. And please be extremely careful not to lose your grip. Otherwise, those will roll everywhere. 
and you will never, ever use baking weights again. So you've been warned. And then all we need to do before we use this is let it cool completely. And you'll see as this cools, it's going to shrink in a little bit from the sides, as well as all your crimping will look better and more even. Yes, it's almost as if I did two of these, and then used the better looking one for the rest of the video. Speaking of which, once our crust is blind baked, we can move on to the very easy filling. And the first step for this would be to add some sugar to some room temperature butter, and then using a spatula, we'll sort of smear that together until it's all combined. And for maybe the first time ever, I remember to leave my butter out. So it was actually nice and soft and easy to work with. So this time at least you're going to be spared watching the usual wrestling match. Although to be perfectly honest, I sort of miss the struggle. It's become somewhat of a meditation. And then what we'll do once that's all been smeared together is add our flour and a little bit of salt. And then basically do the exact same thing. And could we have added our flour and salt to the first step? Probably, but I'm not sure because this is how I've always done it. Which reminds me, yes, of course you can do this using an electric mixer, but I don't for two reasons. One, I don't want to clean it. And two, doing this by hand, I'm going to burn off exactly the same amount of calories as I take in eating a slice of this. So I got that going for me, which is nice. So we will go ahead and smear that together as shown until the flour disappears, at which point we're going to dump in three large eggs. And we'll go ahead and mix those in with a spatula, but not entirely. As soon as it gets annoying to work with, we're going to switch to a whisk and continue mixing with the whisk until this is relatively smooth. And if you wanted to start with the whisk, you could. But I find if you start with the whisk, it all sort of clumps together and gets trapped in the middle of the whisk, which is a situation I never enjoy. So what I like to do is get it started with the spatula until it gets to about this point, and then switch to the whisk. And then like I said, continue on until we have a fairly smooth mixture. And don't worry about any small lumps you might see here or there. We have a few more things to mix in here, so eventually it's going to all be very smooth. So that is looking pretty good right there. And we can proceed to add the rest of the ingredients, which will include a nice splash of real pure vanilla extract, as well as a very generous dose of freshly grated nutmeg. And sure, you can use pre-ground if you want, but I do not recommend it. Freshly grated is significantly better. And if you don't believe me, compare one to the other when you have too much free time in your hands and smell and taste the difference. You will be pretty shocked. And then speaking of freshly grated, we will also add the zest of one lemon, which never doesn't smell amazing. Right, the aromatherapy aspect of cooking is very underrated. And then besides the zest, we will also add the juice of one lemon, which brings us to the star of the show, one cup of buttermilk. Oh yes, the milk of butter. So tangy, so delicious. And what makes this pie so special? And then we'll take our whisk and go ahead and mix this until completely smooth. And I should mention, if you're in a place where you can't get buttermilk, there are a couple ways you can fake it, which I'll talk about on the blog. And that's it. Once this is all nicely mixed together, we'll go ahead and pour it in our now cool crust. And ideally, this much batter will come up just below our decorative edge. Because this will rise a little bit. Not too much, but maybe about a half inch. And then what we'll do once our filling's been transferred in is slowly rotate our dish like this for no apparent reason. At which point we will transfer that into the center of a 350 degree oven for about 45 to 55 minutes or until it's beautifully golden brown and just set. And let me show you what I mean by that. Okay, if we give this the old shake a shake -a, what we want is a very subtle wiggle, but not a soupy jiggle. Okay, so you see that? Everything sort of wiggles together. If just the center's jiggling and it looks a little loose, just pop it back in for a few minutes. But this was perfect. And then we're definitely going to need to let this cool down. And as it does, it'll sort of deflate a little bit and flatten out. And while some folks do like to serve this warm, I think it is way, way better ice cold. So I always refrigerate mine before slicing and serving. But of course, that's going to be up to you. You are, after all, the third eye of your pie. But anyway, I served up a nice cold slice. Garnished with three strategically placed raspberries. And I finished that off with a little dusting of powdered sugar. And that's it. My buttermilk pie is ready to enjoy. So let me grab a fork and dig in. And by the way, have you heard about those people in Asia that get paid millions to eat on camera? I think I could do that because I'm so graceful and elegant. So let me go in from the top and then sort of stab it like this. And then maybe change to a sort of a sideways scooping motion. Let me get this back over there. There we go. Nailed it. 
So yes, of course I'm kidding. That was terrible. But forget all that. That bite was extraordinarily delicious. Imagine a custard pie meets a lemon meringue pie meets a cheesecake. That is pretty much what we have here. So let me cleanse my palate with a raspberry and go in for another taste. Oh, and by the way, even though it's going to stay pretty pale, because we did give our crust a head start, it does not taste raw or feel all soft and gummy. So I really do recommend that extra step. But no matter what crust you use or how you prepare it, this is just an incredibly delicious slice of pie. And like I said in the intro, it really is shocking this isn't more popular. But possibly if enough of you make this and share it with your friends and family, the word will spread and the buttermilk pie will take its rightful place in the pantheon of great American pies. But regardless of whether that happens or not, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Apple hand pies. That's right, I'm gonna show you my patented method for making perfect hand pies, also known as turnovers. And I know you're thinking those look too perfect to be homemade. I bet those are store-bought. Well, thank you. That is the best compliment you can get for these things. It means you made them so real, they look fake. And even though I'm gonna fill mine with apple, this technique's gonna work with any filling you like. So let me show you how this works. It's surprisingly easy. So like I said, I went with an apple filling, so I'm gonna peel some apples. I know some of you prefer the parry knife method. I really think a peeler works better for these. I go around the top like that, and then I make nice, big, wide peels around the side. And for me, that's the easiest way to peel an apple. Unless you're gonna do a ton, then you need one of those cool turny things, okay? So once the apple's peeled, we're gonna go ahead and quarter that, and then we're gonna take the core out, which is pretty easy. You can do it this way, just hold the apple and pull the paring knife towards your thumb like that, being very careful to stop before it goes into your thumb. And if you're slightly less coordinated, this is a good method, just put it on its side, and make a little 45 degree cut like that, and that works too. So once you take the core out, we're gonna take each quarter, cut it into three pieces, and then cut it into chunks. For four ham pies, two large apples should be enough. Mine were kind of smaller, I did three. So I had a little extra filling, but that's fine. At that point, I put a couple tablespoons of butter in a heavy skillet over medium heat until it got a beautiful toasty brown. So just keep an eye on it. And when that foam gets a nice little golden nutty brown color, go ahead and throw in your apples. We're going to give them a little pinch of salt, give them a little stir in that hot butter. I'm also going to add some white sugar and just a little touch of brown sugar. And then at this point, I made a conscious decision to go with a soft filling. Some people like to make their pies and turnovers with raw apples, just tossing it with the sugar and just relying on the baking time to cook the apple. Here I was going for something much softer, almost like an apple jam or an apple butter. Okay, so I cook mine nice and soft. Those little chunks of apple will kind of swell up and break down. Swell up, swell up, and break down. And once they got to that point, I dumped in a nice healthy dose of cinnamon. I'm gonna mix that in. And by the way, I wish you could smell the aroma. Just such an incredible bonus, you get to smell this stuff as it cooks. It's really half the fun. And then last but not least, I put in a little tiny splash of water just to deglaze the pan a little bit, soften these apples up just a little more. Cause like I said, I really want an apple buttery, jammy applesauce type filling, not a firm piece of apple we're gonna bite into. All right, just personal preference. You only want to cook yours for a minute or not at all? Go ahead. That's perfectly legit. But anyway, to summarize, you're going to cook your apples in butter, sugar, and cinnamon until they're as soft as you like. So I went all the way to the soft and sticky stage. So once that's done, I'm going to transfer that onto a plate to cool while we roll out our dough. Speaking of which, here it is. You're going to need some pie dough. And I will tell you at this point that the one I'm using here is a new secret recipe called Butter Crust that I'm going to unveil next week. So you're going to stay tuned for that. It was unbelievable. So we're going to take about four ounces of whatever dough you're using, enough to make about an eight inch round. It doesn't have to be exact. These are hand pies. Nobody's going to measure your hand pie. Okay. And also don't worry about perfect circles. Perfect circles are annoying. Get it close. It just needs to be circle-ish. And once you do have an eight inch circle-ish shaped piece of dough, we're gonna go ahead and spoon in about a third to a half a cup of filling, right, right near the center. We're gonna fold over the dough, but we're gonna fold it over about an inch short, just like that. We're gonna tap it down around the filling with our fingertips, nice and firmly. That is the first of three levels of crust security. The second's gonna be this. I want you to go around and just fold over the overlap, just like that, all right, nice and tight, all the way around. And once that's been folded over and pressed down, we're gonna to go to the third phase, which is the crimping. And I know they say crimping ain't easy, but that's so not true. Crimping is easy, all right? Take the thumb and forefinger of one hand, 
press it in, and push in between with the forefinger of your other hand. And you will have a perfect, so good it looks fake, crimped crust. So you're pushing with two fingers and you're pressing in between with the other. Your thumb is moving into the indentation that your forefinger just made. And it really is that easy. So once you're folded and fully crimped, we're going to transfer these onto a lined baking sheet. And then we're ready for the egg wash. Some beaten egg with a little bit of milk. I'm going to pin it on generously. And then we're also going to sprinkle these with sugar. If you're feeling savory, of course, you'll skip this step. Or you'll substitute something like a finely grated Parmesan cheese, or maybe some herbs and spices, something like that. And then once they are sugared, we're going to go ahead and put three ventilation holes in the top. And this is key. If you don't make those holes, the steam will not be able to escape. Your pie will rupture. You'll lose all those delicious caramely juices from the middle, and your oven could possibly explode. All right. Once we've achieved proper ventilation, we're going to go ahead and pop those in a preheated 400 degree oven for about 25 minutes to a half hour until they look browned, crispy, and gorgeous. Look at those. Just a beautiful specimen of a hand pie. I really want to eat one right now, but they're so molten hot inside, do not try it. Let them sit for 15 minutes. You will enjoy it much, much more. And after that though, all bets are off. I bit into that thing and I was so happy. Like I said, I went with a very soft, almost like an apple jam or apple butter filling. But again, if you want the chunks of apple, like a traditional apple pie filling, go for it. And you can see here the extreme flakiness of that dough. That is the new butter crust pie dough I'm going to show you next week. But like I said, no matter what dough you use, no matter what fillings you use, this technique should work perfectly. All right? So I really hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with s'more ice cream pie. That's right, we're turning s'mores into a Father's Day inspired dessert. And I'll explain that in more detail on the blog. But basically a s'more is one of the few desserts your father actually knows the recipe for. And he'll associate it with so many things men love. Building fires, carving pointy sticks, skewering things, and so forth. So I think this is going to be the perfect Father's Day dessert. And we're going to start off with a very manly step. We're going to have to crush some graham crackers. Now you could do these in a plastic bag with like a mallet or a rolling pin or something like that. That's not manly. Get in there with your bare hands and crush those into a fine crumb. Something like that. And at that point we're going to add some white granulated sugar and some melted butter. And then just take your spoonula and mix that until well combined. At that point we're going to go ahead and transfer that into a pie dish. I think this is your standard 9 inch size. And we're simply going to use our spatula to spread that out as evenly as we can. And I always find making graham cracker crust very therapeutic. That mixture is going to remind you of wet sand. And wet sand is going to remind you of building sandcastles, which will remind you of the tide coming in before you were done and wrecking the whole thing. Good times on the beach. And when you have that spread as evenly as you think you can get it with the spatula or spoonula, just switch to the bare hands and try to even everything out. I like to go around the outside and kind of smooth it out a little bit, make it a little nicer looking. Will dad notice? No, that's not the point. And once I've done those edges and everything's nice and smooth, I'm gonna go ahead and pop that in the fridge for at least a half hour until it's well chilled. And at that point, we're gonna fill it with chocolate ice cream. Now I want you to let the ice cream soften a little bit, but not a ton, because the best method for this is to scoop it in with a little ice cream scoop like this. And as you scoop, the ice cream is gonna get softer and softer. And by the time you scoop it out, all the soft stuff, will be very easy to nestle into the harder scoops below. And another reason I like this method is because if you just plopped everything in there and tried to spread it, you'd probably tear up your crust and break your crust up. And did you want a broken crust? Of course not. So that's why I like this method. Once I've transferred all the ice cream in, I'm gonna switch to a spatula and smooth out the top best I can. All right, and then once that's smoothed out nicely, we're gonna go ahead and place a ring of mini marshmallows all the way around the outside, around the outside, around the outside, to make kind of a border. And once we've gone all the way around, we can go ahead and just fill in the center. All right, three or four handfuls, whatever it takes to cover the top. Pretty much a single layer. But if you have a few extra here and there, of course that's not a problem. No one's ever said, hey dude, there's too many marshmallows on your s'more ice cream pie. All right, so don't worry about that. And then once you have total coverage, I want you to gently press those down into the surface, just to settle those into the ice cream layer. And then that whole thing's going to go into the freezer for at least, at least an hour or two. Longer's even better. We want this very firm before we toast our marshmallows. And at that point, you can pull it out of the freezer. And then it's time for what I'm predicting will be Dad's favorite part of this operation. The burning of the top. 
And we're not using any fancy creme brulee torch from that fancy gourmet shop, which costs like 50 bucks and is half the size of a real blowtorch. We're going to use an actual blowtorch, hopefully from your dad's workshop. But if not, find yourself a blowtorch and go over the top. So as you see, I'm moving it around very quickly, trying to get an even burn. And don't worry about black spots. It has to have the black spots. A real s'more is done with a perfectly charred marshmallow. That's such an important part of the flavor. So I want you to do it at least as dark as I'm doing it. And if I wasn't filming this, I'm going to be honest, I would do it darker. So you're going to keep that moving. You're not going to stay on any one spot too long. All right, if part of it catches on fire, blow it out. And that's what mine looked like when it was done. And then I'm going to recommend you put this back in the freezer until it firms up enough to slice. You could probably slice it now and serve it. But it really is going to be a lot easier if you give it a few hours. And you can see here, if you do chill it, you'll get nice, fairly clean slices. And there you can see those classic three layers of the s'more. The graham cracker, the chocolate, and the toasted marshmallow. So like I said, I really think dads are going to like this. They'll associate it with camping and having to build the fire. They love to do that kind of stuff. And of course, it tasted exactly like a frozen s'more. Just a classic combination of flavors. Oh, and by the way, if someone asks for seconds and they say, can I have some more pie? You have to say, which one? And then they say, some more. And you're like, yeah, I know, which one? That's so funny and it will not grow tiresome at all. Trust me, okay? So whether you're trying this for Father's Day or not, I really hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Bye.